Welcome back to our discussion of model assessment. Uh, we're in, in the section where we're talking about graphical assessments, graphical comparisons between models and data. In the last uh, video, I focused specifically on uh, predicted versus observed plots. And in this video, I want to talk more broadly about other ways we can plot models and data together to understand uh, what models are doing and how they might be going wrong. So here's an example that can be particularly common because we deal with a lot of time series data uh, in environmental sciences is to look at what we would call dynamics of a model. So here, you know, we have a model that, that is making, the, the solid line is a model that's making a prediction in time uh, and the dots are, are the, the observed data. And if we look at panel B on the right-hand side, we see an example of, of systematic bias. We see that as we look at the, the model and the data dynamics through time, that the model is, is consistently about half uh, with the, what the data is uh, seeing. Uh, and usually, you know, an example like this will jump out at you in the predictive observed plot as a systematic bias, uh, either an additive or multiplicative bias. Um, you know, I'm not sure whether this everything needs to be added a value or multiply value, but the point is you, it, would, it would actually show up because you would see a, a, a nice correlation between the predictions and the observations, but they're not going to fall on the one-to-one -one line. Uh, by contrast, what we see in panel A uh, is the models actually getting uh, the dynamics correctly, it's getting the, the amplitude correctly, uh, but it's getting the timing off. So, you know, and I'm not sure what the units of time here, but you know, whatever the spacing is about one unit, you know, the 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 model's off by about one or two units in time. And so it's shifted. Now the problem with uh, a plot like uh, you know a response like this is that if you looked at the predicted observed plot, it would be really hard to diagnose because sometimes uh, you, know, you have three data points that are consistently above the model, then you have three data points that are consistently below the model, then you have all these, this chunk of data that's above the mo one, the model, then the other one's below. So you'd have some that's on the um, uh, uh, positive biases and some that are negative biases, uh, and, and they're at, at the same range of values. Uh, sometimes you're in one direction, sometimes you're the other, but so, so you wouldn't have a nice uh, pattern in the predictive observed plot to, to interpret. By contrast, something that's very hard to interpret in the predictive observed plot, when you plot it uh, versus time, it might become you know, immediately obvious uh, what you're seeing. In this case, we're seeing uh, you know, a phase shift, you know, a shift in the timing of the events. And, and that would send you down uh, you know, one set of questions in your model. You'd have to understand your model, but you know, understand you know, what's causing the timing events in the model, that's what needs to be fixed. Another thing that can be really useful when assessing models that have more than one variable in them uh, is to plot the output of the model uh, versus the inputs or the drivers or the covariates. And so here's an example. Again, we're often using land models as an example. So here are predictions of gross primary productivity, so the, the, the photosynthetic rate of a whole ecosystem uh, measured from one of those towers. Lux towers, uh, and so the observed data and its uncertainty is in this solid black line with an error bar. And here are predictions from a whole bunch of mechanistic models. So these are models that, that represent the, pro the photosynthetic process. Uh, and we see that in all the models, we get a positive relationship between uh, shortwave radiation and photosynthesis. Um, but many of the models are underestimating it. So they're kind of showing this damped response, kind of a multiplicative bias. And it, it, be, it might not be obvious uh, plotting the data across time. It might not be obvious doing a predictive observed plot, uh, but it might become more clear when you predict the model versus a set of inputs that it's this relationship. And in, in this case, you know, there's a lot of things that affect photosynthetic rate. It's not just light, it's also CO2 and humidity, available soil moisture, um, you know, the amount of leaves. Um, and, and we're seeing by here, by predicting, plotting a, you know, one specific input versus a prediction, kind of isolating that something in that part of the rela relationship you have is, is what's wrong. Um, and then you could then, from that point, start 
forming hypotheses about why that might be wrong. And so, uh, you know, in, in the case of a total photosynthetic rate, you know, there's kind of two obvious hypotheses. One would be, you know, the leaf level response to light is wrong. The model, you need to recalibrate the sensitivity of, of leaves uh, to light. And the other might be your model is not predicting enough leaves. So if the model has half as many leaves as it's supposed to, it will have, you know, a lower photosynthetic rate. And so for each of these models, you could go then and die, go down that road and say like, okay, it's GPP is too low. Can I look at a plot of what the model predicted for the amount of leaves versus what was observed? And that would isolate uh, you down to, you know, one of those two branches of what went wrong. Uh, and the next plot, um, Below this, we're now still looking at GPP, uh, but now we're looking at GPP versus human humidity. And actually, this lower plot was normalized uh, such that um, we know that the absolute magnitude of GPP was biased from the first plot. So we normalized this by relative to the maximum of each of them, each model. We kind of eliminated this calibration bias and then asked how do the models represent the relationship between humidity, GPP. And we see that for high humidity, uh, all the models kind of get the right relationship, which is kind of cool. Um, so even though they were biased in their representation of, uh, between light uh, and, and photosynthesis, their relationship between humidity and photosynthesis wasn't biased at high humidity. Uh, but then we see at low humidity, you know, kind of the models are going all over the place. And the fact that this is a kind of a curvy relationship and that they do well on one end actually makes it in some ways harder to figure out what's going on because it's it's errors is isolated to a specific set of conditions uh, and it's not just a simple miscalibration you know that it's it's a case where the actual shape of the relationship is wrong you know reflecting that maybe the, uh, the choice of underlying equations uh, may have been wrong for some of these models because they they didn't just uh, have the right shape but the wrong magnitude but they actually had the wrong shape and that's actually an important distinction when diagnosing models. Are the models getting the right general dynamics, the right patterns, but you know the magnitudes are off, uh, or are they fundamentally not capturing the shape of the relationship they're trying to predict, which you know usually means the equations are off, or the equations are missing something. There's something in there that, that needs to be in there that isn't in there yet. Uh, another thing that be, can be particularly common when uh, working with environmental data is that environmental data often represents processes at multiple time scales. So, you know, when we were looking at some of the, the data from these flux towers over the last few diagnostics, we were often looking at them at an aggregated time scale, an annual time scale or a daily time scale. Um, but this is a, you know, these are processes that have dynamics over multiple time scales. And so these are here isolating, say, you know, let's ignore uh, or average over uh, what the kind of year-to-year -year variability in this model was and just ask, did I get the, the daily cycle right? So, you know, in a lot of environmental processes, you can have you know, daily cycles, you can have seasonal cycles. Uh, for aquatic stuff, you can have tidal cycles, or for coastal processes in particular. Um, you know, you have different cycles and you might have to check the dynamics of the model across different time scales for different processes. And this this case is showing observations in a dotted line against three variants of a model and their ability to capture different parts of uh, the energy budget. And unfortunately showing that, you know, as the model does better uh, on one of those factors, it does worse on the other. So this model's kind of not able to hit both things at the same time. It, it, uh, it's kind of a trade-off suggesting there's something deeper involved wrong with the model. So one of the things that we're kind of getting to with these various forms of, of diagnostic plots isn't necessarily a litany of plots that you would want to uh, make in every case, but more the idea that uh, as we explore models, it requires creativity. It requires thinking about uh, how the model works and what it represents uh, and what's involved, you know, the time scales involved, the covariates involved, um, you know, is it a spatial model where you should be plotting things in space? Is it a temporal model where you should be plotting things in time? But as we dive more and more, 
you know, I was started talking about, you know, when I see this pattern, how would I figure out what was wrong? And, and really want to drive home the point that a lot of uh, diagnosing uh, whether a model is doing well or not, or diagnosing what it's doing when it clearly isn't doing something right, involves hypothesis testing. It involves posing alternative explanations for why a model might be doing what it's doing, and then going down and testing, uh, thinking about how I might assess that. I might do start that initially by thinking about, oh, you know, if this is wrong and I plot things this way, it might become apparent. And sometimes it re requires just rerunning the model to tease out uh, what's going on. So if we come back to this uh, figure that we just talked about where we had, you know, the models in general were doing well uh, under high humidity, so they got that, but now they're diverging under low humidity, I might have, you know, pose the question, why would a model fail at low humidity? And I would need to start posing explanations for that, you know, and, and they have to be grounded in the structure of the model, though. Uh, so I've seen lots of folks uh, you know, look at a model that fails and then start posing, oh, you know, maybe it did this wrong or did that wrong. And they're talking about things that aren't, aren't in their model at all. It's like, no, it's like, you know, this isn't because, you know, the model misrepresented deer. You know, there's, no, there's not deer in this model. You know, this is, you know, about something going on in the canopy and I need to understand, you know, what are the processes represented in this particular model um, to understand which ones are wrong or which ones are missing. Um, so in this case, you know, again, you know, kind of alluded to with the uh, GP, the light response that, you know, my, my error might be going uh, wrong on the leaf level. So at the leaf level, I might have the sensitivity to humidity wrong in the model, um, such that, you know, for some of these models that should be closing when the humidity gets close, the smarter the pores on a leaf that let water vapor out and CO2 in, and they close during drought conditions to conserve water. So here we might see when the things are getting dry, uh, there's something in that relationship that's wrong, uh, or it might be somewhere else. It might be that um, when it's actually dry out, the model doesn't realize it's dry out. So there might be just too much soil moisture in the in the model, and so you know uh, it's getting dry, uh, but the model doesn't realize it's getting dry, and so it just keeps plugging away. And so the question would then be, you know, what experiments would I run? To test the models, I have kind of two hypotheses. What what would disambiguate those two hypotheses? You know, it might be uh, you know creating variants of the model where I change the model sensitivity. It might be creating variants of the model where I manipulate the soil moisture or manipulate the parameters to control the soil moisture. And so I would try to isolate uh, problems and test hypotheses. And like I said, isolation is a real key part. You know, if you can come up with a, uh, a way of you know, dividing up uh, what could be going wrong in the model in a way that splits the options down every time. So if, if I had, you know, think about it this way, if I had 20 things that I think might be wrong, uh, it could take me a long time to find them if I uh, test them one at a time. But if I have a way of doing tests that split things every, you know, split them into you know, he, this half of the problems have this characteristic, this have another, I can split it from 20 to 10, from 10 to five, from five, you know, to two to one. So this kind of, bran the, the kind of a branching approach to isolating errors uh, will get you, uh, will help you find what's going wrong quicker than a sequential approach. And sometimes in code, that could be like, you know, I have a, I have a long complicated model, they've written out and you could literally say like is the error in the first half or is the error in the second half you know put a check in the middle and isolate i know it's in the first half okay if i know it's in the first half is it in the first quarter or the second quarter so any kind of ways of coming up with tests that kind of progressively split the amount of space that where something could be going wrong uh, are, are particularly useful Okay, so I'm gonna wrap up there on these kind of visual assessments of model performance. And I'm next gonna move on to kind of how we can use uh, quantitative skill scores uh, to assess model performance.